So you're always just going to be learning on the job. So it's okay to not know everything. And it's definitely okay to feel like you're not ready or like you're underprepared. Hi, everybody. Hi, welcome to eShadowing, guys. Hi, I'm Rodalyn, as you all may know. And today we have Nicole Finn. Nicole is a Derm PA for our Derm segment. Um, thank you so much, Nicole, for coming on. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Nicole is um, out here in New York. And as I said, she is a Derm PA. So we're going to jump right in. So, um, Nicole, tell us a little bit about your PA journey, why you chose PA and different things you did to prepare for PA school. Yeah. So my PA journey um, started when I was in high school. So I would say definitely in high school, I always knew I wanted to do something in medicine, but was kind of unsure about what exactly that would be. So I just started doing some research about different careers in medicine and then also started shadowing some different um, healthcare workers in medicine. And I ended up shadowing one of them was a PA. And I really enjoyed what she did. And I honestly, I didn't really know much about a PA at that point. And I was so amazed that she was able to see the patients. Um, she was able to do some minor procedures. Um, and she also was able to change specialties if she wanted to. So that was really appealing to me. So um, those were a few things as to why I was interested in being PA. So then I just further did more research. Um, and again, I really liked the career. So I did research about PA school. So yeah, so I applied to accelerated PA programs, which means that, um, so I was applying when I was a senior in high school. Um, okay. And there's a lot of these programs nowadays, you know, there was a lot back, whatever it was, five years ago, whenever I was applying, but there's also a lot now. So basically that means you apply when you're a senior in high school and you're going to go to that school, that same school for undergrad, as well as PA school. Um, a lot of times you can be guaranteed a C in their PA program, but of course you have to meet all the requirements. It's not like you, you know, you have to meet a GPA requirements. You still have to get patient care hours, everything like that. So there's still all these requirements you still have to meet in order to get a C in their PA program. But the reason why this is appealing is because it's um, usually quicker. So I did undergrad in three years and then just automatically went into the PA program. So I did everything in five years, undergrad um, and PA school. So that's why that, that, that can be appealing to some people because um, you're not taking any gap years. But of course, if you want to take a gap year, that's completely up to you. Um, but that's what I did. So I did that. And the school I went to was King's College, which is in Wilkes there. I'm sorry? Um, King's College, which is in Wilkes. Oh, Bear. okay. Yeah. Um, and um, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. So I went there and um, it's a small school, but I know a lot of people do like their PA program. So I went there and then after undergrad, took the PANTS exam, which is the certifying PA exam. And then a couple weeks after that, started my first job, which is dermatology. And that's the specialty that I've been doing for the past, it's been almost three years, which is crazy. I can't believe it. It's been that long. Um, I'm sorry. You said so your, your first job, you said your first job was, I'm sorry, we're having connection issues. I'm so sorry. You said your oh. first job was derm? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So okay. that's a little bit about um, my quick little PA school journey. Awesome. Awesome. So um, being that you were in an accelerated program and uh, didn't really have a gap year or didn't um, have to apply to multiple schools, did you were you also expected to get that healthcare experience? Yeah. So I still had to get um, healthcare experience and patient care hours. My school required 500 um, patient care hours. So I had to do that. I started it um, the summer before going into my freshman year. Yep. The summer before going into my freshman year is when I started it. And then I continued it every summer until I got all the hours. And I had to have all the hours completed by, I think, midway through my junior year of undergrad, I believe. So, oh, wow. Yeah. So the, the first summer before freshman year, I did, I took an EMT course. So I got some out, some indirect patient care hours. Um, from that. And then I took the exams to um, 
become a certified EMT, which I did become a certified EMT. I just never ended up uh, getting a job as one because by the time I finished all of this, it was time to go to school um, and start my freshman year of undergrad. So I just never ended up getting a job in that. And then okay. the following summer, the two things that I did for hours, which I did to get uh, the rest of my hours was I was uh, basically a CNA. I wasn't technically certified, but that's what I did. Um, the places that I worked at, they said I didn't have to be certified in that, but that's essentially what I did. So that that counted as all my patient care hours. So yeah, so again, I had to get 500 patient care hours, um, which is a little bit on the lower side. I would say uh, nowadays, a lot of people are definitely getting a lot more hours than that. Right, right. Now it's like 2000 plus hours. But that's I mean, that's great that, you know, even though it was, um, you know, kind of a direct entrance program, you know, they still had a, a set of number of hours, but they didn't ask like, you know, a crazy number like 2000, especially being yeah. that, you know, you're you're still in college and or going from high school straight to college and having to do all this within a certain amount of time. But that's really awesome. Yeah, yeah. So were your plans to um to always do derm? I couldn't quite hear you. Um, or how were you able to get into derm? Yeah, so I would say my plans pretty much was always to do derm. I knew that's always what I wanted to do because I always um really liked medical derm, you know, like um acne, rashes, skin cancers. But I would say more of my interest um was always in cosmetic derm. So, um, like aesthetics, so, uh, lasers, Botox fillers, everything like that. I would say that's kind of what I saw myself more getting into. So yeah, I always knew I wanted to do derm, although, you know, there were times where, um, you know, I mean, I, I didn't do a rotation in dermatology until the very end of PA school. That was actually my last rotation. And I said, if I didn't like it, you know, if I did my rotation, I didn't like derm, then obviously I would do something else, but I kind of had a feeling I was going to like it, um, and I did. So that's why after my derm rotation, I uh, started my career in derm. But my second choice was OBGYN, actually. That was my second choice. I did really like that as well, and I did interview for jobs for that um, as my second choice. So I did really like that. Um, yeah, so now I've been in dermatology for almost three years. And I do medical dermatology as well as uh, some cosmetic dermatology. Nice, nice. You said you've been in derm for how long? Almost three years. Okay, okay. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So um, before we talk about um, derm, can you tell us a little bit about how PA school was like once you or like how you know, how was that transition like going from um, I know it was the same college, but how was it going from like undergrad and studying and learning one way to then PA school and having to like kind of relearn certain things and really um, learn the learn and absorb the material because you're going to be practicing it and getting into your career. Yeah, definitely. It was um, an adjustment. I definitely didn't, I knew it was going to be difficult, obviously, because everyone um, says it is. And I had friends that were uh, a year older than me that just finished PA school. So they told me, you know, yes, it's hard, but you just don't really know until you're actually in it. So right. yeah, I was definitely nervous, but I didn't really know 100% what to expect. And I think I expected it to be a little bit more easier than what it was. Um, I had assumed like, okay, I have really good time management skills, which I developed during my undergrad. And I feel like by the time I finished undergrad, I had really good time management skills. So I figured, you know, if, if I have good time management skills, I'll be able to get all my studying done at a reasonable hour and then be able to, you know, go to sleep at a reasonable hour and everything will be fine. Kind of. That's not really how it worked out. Definitely there were um, some late nights as well as some early mornings where I would wake up early to study before class or stay up too late to study uh, the night before. And definitely I didn't get as much sleep as I thought I was going to be getting. Um, but obviously everyone's different. This is my personal experience, but I think most people relate to my experience. Um, and pretty much it was studying every single day. I mean, I would come back from class and study until it was time, you know, until I was done, I would go to sleep. 
And then if there was any, ever any breaks in between classes, because it all depends on um, the school schedule, how they do classes. But my school, we did have some breaks like in between classes, sometimes maybe like an hour or two. And I, again, I would try to spend that time studying. Um, so yeah, pretty much, you know, I'd have a little bit of downtime on the weekends, maybe to do something uh, enjoyable <laughs> or not related to PA school. But yeah, I would say majority of the time was spent studying. Um, but keep in mind, you know, it's, it's, you know, in comparison, it's a short amount of time, you know, you're viewing this, you know, this intense studying and learning for like about a year, a little bit over a year. Or so, and then you start your clinicals, which is definitely a lot uh, more easier and less studying. So in comparison, you know, it's really not that long of a time and definitely you, know, you can do it. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. So um, I think we have some questions rolling in um, before we go on to discuss um, DERM. Let's see. Well, we can ask that. What was it like working as a CNA? Yeah, so like I said, I wasn't, I technically wasn't a certified CNA, but that's what I did basically. And yeah, it was fine. I mean, it was a learning experience. I did two different types of jobs. One, I worked, um, at, at home at a patient's home. So it was just me and them. So that was kind of cool because I got to do everything obviously that they needed. The other one was in a hospice, which again, I learned a lot. You know, I followed around and worked with a lot of nurses um, and that, and I learned a lot as well. So I think the reason for patient care hours, it's not just because the school wants you to get a bunch of hours for no reason. Um, it's because they want you to get an experience. You know, all of the hours that you're getting are an experience and you're learning, even though it's obviously it's not going to be the job that you're planning on doing, um, you know, after you finish PA school. But it's all learning and it's all skills that you're developing, which are going to help you further, you know, when you become a PA. Exactly. Exactly. I completely agree with that. All right. And can you talk about the difference between first and second year of PA school? Yeah. So first year is um, didactic year. So that's going to be all your classes. You know, you're going to be taking classes. Um, you know, like I said, every school is going to have a different schedule, but it's most likely Monday through Friday and you're in classes usually all day. Um, and, you know, it's usually like I, said, I mean, of course, every school is different, but mine was we had a fall semester, a spring semester, and then a summer semester of classes. So, and trying to think how many classes we would take a semester. Oh gosh, I don't, I can't think of like an exact number, but it was definitely a good amount of classes a semester, maybe like six or seven. Don't quote me on that, but it's mm -hmm. a good amount of classes. It might it might have been more than that. I don't know, but it's a good amount of classes you're taking, and that's what makes it difficult and challenging. Is that it's a lot of classes and it's a lot of material in a short amount of time. And then when you transition over to the second year of PA school, it's it's easier because it's not all classes, and this is you're going to be doing your rotation. So it's a different kind of difficult, I guess I would say. Because now you're actually like being thrown into it and now you're going to be building on everything that you learn so right you're able to do like certain procedures and skills um and you're going to have a certain expectation you know that you're going to have to see patients and you know present the patient case to your preceptor and of course there is studying that's going to be involved in it you know a lot of schools do like end of rotation exams. So you probably are still not to be studying. You might have some sort of projects. And then of course, um, you're gonna have to st start studying for the uh, PANTS exam, which is the certifying exam. So I'll say majority of people are gonna be start studying for that during this clinical year or the second year of PA school. I started studying for it. So um, I took my exam in uh, the month of August. So I started studying for it around like March time, um, just a little bit. And I would say I really started studying for it that summer. So around like June, May, June was when I really started studying for it. And I took it, keep in mind, and then I took it in August. Um, so yeah, that's the difference between the two. 
Um, they're different. And like I said, they're both difficult and challenging, but in different ways. Okay. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. But um, you were referring to the pants that you started studying for in June? Right. Yeah. So the pants exam. Yep. That's the certifying exam okay. um, that you take. Right. Um, after graduating PA school, you know, in order to become a certified PA. Right, right. Okay. Sorry, I was just having a little trouble hearing you. No, that's okay. All righty. And the last question we'll ask as it relates to um, your pre-PA journey is, why did, um, someone asked, why did you choose PA versus MD slash DO or nursing? Yeah, I get that a lot. So first I'll start, you know, why did I choose this as opposed to MD um, or, or medical school? Um, so as I was saying earlier, there was a few reasons why the PA profession appealed to me. One, you are able to see your own patients and you are independent, but also at the same time, I feel like, um, you know, you're able to rely on uh, your supervising physician which I like because I feel like that fit my personality. You know, I feel like I would consider myself a leader, but at the same time, I know I'm the type of person that I like to have that reassurance um, there and someone there if I need to ask questions um, or need to depend upon. So I know that that just fit my personality better. Um, and of course, like I said, the main thing I know was um, being able to change specialties pretty easily. Again, I kind of felt like maybe Durham was what I wanted to do, but that doesn't mean that's always what I'm going to want to do. I definitely think I have a personality that I like to try new things. And um, I feel like, you know, I was, I, I wanted the opportunity to be able to change specialties. Now in comparison to nursing, first I want to say like a lot of people always ask me why I didn't go to nurse practitioner school. And um, to be honest, at the time, I didn't know about nurse practitioner school or what that career even was. So right. I can't really say um, why I chose one or the, you know, PA over that because I didn't know about that career. Um, and as far as nursing, um, again, I, I like to be um, independent. So I wanted to be able to see my own patients. So that's why I chose PA because you are uh, obviously able to see more of your own patients and be a little bit more um, independent than nursing. Right, right, right. Makes some sense. Okay. Um, there was also actually a great question. Someone asked, um, when did you take the GRE? Yeah. So I actually never took the GRE. My school, uh, my PA school okay. did not require it. So I actually did not have nice. to. Nice. Lucky. <laughs> Yeah. So there are PA schools that don't require it. Um, although I'd say it's definitely becoming more popular that a lot of PA schools are requiring it. But yes, yeah, so I can't really speak too much, um, uh, too much about it because, yeah, I didn't have to take it. Okay, that's that's awesome that you didn't have to. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> so um being that this was like a direct entrance program like what did you have to like maintain your gpa and of course meet all the requirements before actually um uh fully being accepted right so okay. basically i was you know was technically like, accepted but if i didn't meet all the requirements then um you know basically they would like i don't want to say kick me out but kind of so think about um in my freshman class, we had about maybe like 150, maybe even 180 students that were considered pre-PA students, meaning that we were all accepted into this PA program. Of course, if we met requirements, and we ended up and uh, ended up with maybe around like 50 something. So um, you can imagine how many people either decided to change their major. Maybe this wasn't for them, and they didn't like it. But also a good majority of these people um, didn't meet the requirements. So besides okay. the patient care hours, as I mentioned, um, also there was pretty, pretty strict requirements as far as GPA. I can't tell you, I can't remember them off the top of my head, the exact 
GPA that you had to have, but every semester you had to meet a certain GPA. Okay. Um, and you couldn't get lower than a certain grade in a class. Again, I can't remember the exact grade. And right. then if you did, that was it. You were you were no longer um, given opportunity to further into the PA program. And then, um, you know, you had to change your major or continue on, but then obviously apply to a PA program uh, at another school um, after you graduated. Right, right. Okay. How many um, students do they typically accept or let into the program per semester? Um, so, well, in the, in the undergrad, like when we're all applying as a senior in high school, like I said, I think they accepted maybe like around 150 to 180, but in the actual PA program, I think we only had like 60 something seats. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. So we had like 50 something of our own, uh, school of the kids that went to King's college. And then I think we took maybe about like 10 or so from, um, outside schools. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. Oh, so they still accepted outside schools. Yep. Yeah, we did have some seats. Not always. I guess it depends. It's just my class. We did have extra seats. But, um, you know, there might be some years where there are no extra seats to accept anyone from um, other schools. Oh, okay, okay. Nice, nice, nice. Okay. So um, now we'll move on to discuss um, more about your Durham career. Um, but before we do so, everyone's asking, I put your Instagram, but they also want to know your TikTok. Okay. Um, your TikTok name, is it also Nicole Durham? I mean, Nicole. Yes. It's the same as my Instagram name. Yeah. So Nicole Finn Durham. So N-I-O-L-L-E-F-I-N-N-D-E-R-M. Yeah. So same thing as my Instagram. Okay. Let's do uh, it. My TikTok name. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. Yes, yeah, she has an amazing TikTok and <laughs> makes a great videos. <laughs> Thank you. And, um, I saw some of them already on her Instagram, but check out her TikTok, guys. And are you also on YouTube? I am. Yeah, I haven't posted a video in a while, in a few months, but I actually have a few videos that I filmed. I just haven't gotten around to editing them and uploading them, but I do have a YouTube, too. I don't even know. I think you could just, if you're looking for my YouTube, you could just search again, like Nicole Finn Durham. And I think it should come up, but I'm not a hundred percent sure what my name on YouTube is, but yeah, if you just search that, that should come up as well. And I have some pretty good videos on there. Um, like, like talking about different like PA school experiences that I've had. Yes. Yes. Informative videos. <laughs> All right. So um, first, can you start um, by telling us a um, little bit about Derm, um, basically like a day in the life from when you clock in to clock out, your hours, patient population, just um, just spill everything out to us. We want to know. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So um, right now, my schedule is um, Mondays and Thursdays. I work up around like 10 hours. So like like nine to seven ish or like eight to six ish Tuesdays and Fridays. I work around six hours. So like 7 AM to one ish. Um, and I would say this is around like a similar amount of hours that people work in dermatology. Usually it's around like 40 or less hours. I really don't know anyone in dermatology who works more than 40 hours. Nice. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because dermatology, you know, it's, usually non-emergent, meaning that, you know, it's strictly like an office-based medicine, although there are obviously, uh, you know, there is some dermatology a little bit in hospital-based medicine and inpatient, but majority of the time it's going to be outpatient, you know, like a standard like Monday through Friday. There are some times where some jobs where you might have to work maybe like a Saturday or something, but yeah, usually, you know, it's not like there's any like overnight shifts. Um, right like weekend shifts or like anything like that. Um, so I go into work and we've been very busy lately, actually, like ever since we, cause we closed a little bit, uh, you know, when the pandemic first started back a year ago and ever since we opened back up again, um, we've been extremely busy. So, um, my day is pretty busy. I get into work and pretty much I start seeing like that patients start coming right away. So, I see patients pretty much all day long and, you know, maybe there might be a little break here and there, or sometimes it might get a little slow if patients cancel, but 
pretty much it's busy. I'm seeing patients all day long. Um, patient appointments typically are around like 10 minutes, although that can vary depending if they're coming from, for some sort of like procedure or something that's going to take a little bit longer. But um, typically 10 minutes for a patient appointment. And that can range anywhere from, I would say, most common things, acne, definitely um, because a lot of people have been getting acne by wearing the masks a lot. So I've definitely been seeing a lot more acne than usual. And um, hair loss, although I feel like that's been getting a little bit better, but a lot of people are experiencing hair loss from having COVID um, and just the stress of it all. So I've seen a lot. Um, rashes, I mean, there's, there's so many different types of rashes. I mean, the, it's crazy how many different types of rashes there are. So all different types of rashes, um, skin cancer screenings, as well as doing biopsies yeah. to remove Hello? molds that are suspicious for skin cancer. Um, and yeah, different types of procedures like freezing moles, um, injecting scars, so that's medical dermatology. And then as well as I'll do some cosmetics as well. So um, various types of lasers, like laser hair removal, um, Botox, fillers, um, different types of other procedures on the face, such as chemical peels and microneedling. Um, and then in between patients, you know, when I have time, I try to do my notes. Just keep in mind you have to write a note for every patient that you see. So I try to do the notes in between patients as well as, um, you know, if there's any lab results that came back from patients, uh, biopsies or anything, we have to try to call the patients uh, about those. Um, or if the patient calls in about a question, you know, we have to try to answer, you know, call the patient back to answer those questions. So honestly, it's a pretty busy day. Um, and then... Whenever I'm done for the day, um, tr I tend to get out like around, you know, on time, although sometimes it does run a little bit late. So I get out of work and that's pretty much it. I rarely have to do anything for work, actually. Hello? Outside of work. Yeah. Can you hear me? Um, it cut off. You said you get out around. Um, that's the last thing I heard. Okay. So yeah, I get off uh, like around like the time that I'm scheduled to get out. Yeah. So I typically don't stay okay. after super late. Um, and I typically don't really have to do anything at home for work because I pretty much am getting um, <clears throat> everything done at work that has to be done. So uh, and so, that, yeah, that's a typical day. Um, I hope that kind of explains um, as much as possible. But um, yeah, I, I have I have a YouTube video actually on my YouTube that I did try to do like a day in the life um, as, best, as best as possible. So if anyone wants to check that out actually have a video on it. Oh, awesome. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. And um, that's awesome. So um, being that today was Monday, I'm sure you had a busy day. So thank you so much for taking the time out to, yeah. um, to come on e-shadowing, especially after such, I'm sure, a busy Monday. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, it's all good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So um, how many patients do you typically see in a day? So yeah, when it's like a 10 hour shift, I would say around like in the high 30s, sometimes like 40 patients, um, a six hour shift, it's still like quite a bit, maybe like around like 20 or so, maybe a little bit more. So yeah, you can imagine that's, uh, yeah, that's a lot of patients um, in that span of uh, time period. That is, that is a whole lot of patients, especially only having like 10 minutes to go from patient to patient. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, so um, what's your favorite procedure to do? My favorite procedure? Um, <laughs> I like injecting, definitely okay. for sure. So like um, injecting like keloids or injecting like acne cysts. Um, keloids are pretty cool to inject because a keloid is a raised, it's a type of raised scar. Right. Uh, so the point of injecting, uh, we're injecting steroid into the scar. And the point of this is to try to get it flat. Um, mm. One that, you know, it makes it feel better. So a lot of times these raised scars get itchy and feel irritated. So it makes it feel better as well as um, it makes it look better as well. So I think that's pretty interesting to see the progression of like a keloid scar start to flatten. Um, so that's pretty fun. I like cool. So 
Yeah. So when you inject um, to keloid, what's the chance of it um, re-scarring or, you know, not um, being effective? Yeah. So, I mean, um, it's not like injecting it is going to make the scar completely go away. It just helps to decrease the raisedness of it. And But there's always a chance that the scar could re-raise. So definitely there's a good chance. Um, I don't know. I don't know exact percentages, but yeah, there is a chance that the scar could definitely re-raise. Nice. Okay. So, um, do you work pretty independently? How often do you work with your supervising? Is he always there? How is that dynamic? Yeah. So, um, he's not always there. He or so, she, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's a he, but yeah, he's not always there. Um, we majority of the time don't really overlap that much. Um, maybe sometimes we might overlap a little bit where he's there the same time I'm there. But pretty much we actually don't overlap that much. Um, some people, like, it all depends because some people in my company might overlap a little bit more with their supervising physician. But just the way our schedules work, we just don't really um, overlap that much. But, of course, he's always there. If I have a question, I'll text him, call him, um, email him. So he's, he's definitely always available if I need um, to ask him a question when he's not actually in the office. Okay, cool. So um, one question was, oh, wait, I had a good, I'm sorry, looking for that question. Uh, it basically said, how um, how long did it take you to uh, transition or adjust to, um, you know, the, the, your specialty once you started or was a new grad? Or how was that adjustment? Yeah, yeah so Definitely, I think everyone um, kind of feels the same way when you graduate PA school and start whatever specialty you're going to be in. Definitely, everyone feels like underprepared. You know, you lack confidence. You know, you're like, oh, my gosh, how am I going to do this? But right. every job, you know, when you're a new grad has a training period, usually they should. So they have a period where, you know, they're going to train you and you're going to shadow um, so that's where you're going to, you know, learn everything that you need for the job. And of course, once you finish this training period, um, which sometimes it can range from a month to like a few months, mine was like around six months, which is pretty good. Um, again, you're still not going to feel 100% confident, but you will definitely gain more confidence, um, you know, with time. And, you know, you definitely you're, you're just always learning. So you're always just going to be learning on the job. So it's okay to not know everything. And it's definitely okay to feel like you're not ready or like you're underprepared. Yes, that's very true. Um, so as far as, um, as far as injecting, you had to get certified, right? For uh, Botox and um, all that certification. Did, so were you able to get like certified through your job or take another course? Yeah, so my job was good that they did allow me to get certified through my job. Okay. I would say probably majority of dermatology offices will probably offer training through the job, you know, uh, although some might make you look um, at outside places or elsewhere. But yeah, probably majority of derm, they're going to help you find uh, or help you get certified on the job. So they would have trainings that we would go to after work. And um, that's how you would get certified in these uh, cosmetic procedures. Okay, nice. And how long did it take you to get comfortable with injecting? Um, yeah, definitely a while. I mean, you know, the first patient, you're definitely really nervous. And, you know, it takes a few patients to definitely feel comfortable. And then there's always, like, new techniques and new um, things coming out. So definitely cosmetics, you're always going to be learning and always going to be training um, on procedures. Right, right. Very true. <laughs> okay. Just looking at more questions. And you have uh, holidays off, right? Yeah, we have, you know, like all the major holidays off. Um, Thanksgiving, like New Year's Day, um, like 4th of July. Yeah. So all the major holidays, uh, we do have off. Yes. Okay. Nice. And, uh, this is probably re likely repeat cause I know you answered this earlier about how you landed the derm job. Can you just reiterate that for us, please? 
Yeah, yeah. I didn't straight I didn't out of school about that. Yeah. So um because a lot of people, if you don't already know, dermatology um can be difficult to get into. Um the reason for it right. um is because it just like dermatology for some reason they're usually not willing to hire new grads because they want people who have experience. So I applied to a lot of jobs and they all wanted like three years experience. So that can be difficult because how are you supposed to get experience if no job is willing to hire you as a new grad? So um, I applied to a lot of dermatology jobs. You know, I would send my resume. I would do a cover letter. Um, I applied to a lot of dermatology jobs and, you know, I, w- I wasn't getting really that many interviews. And like I said, it's because they wanted people with experience, which makes sense. I understand. Um, so I feel like I kind of had to try to do something else because it wasn't really working out. You know, yes, like I said, I was getting some interviews, but it wasn't really for a job, like a dermatology job that um, wasn't really what I was looking for. So I started reaching out on social media, actually. So um, someone that worked at the company that I work at now, actually, she followed me on Instagram. So um, and I saw that she followed me. So I messaged her on Instagram asking if I could come shadow um, for a couple hours. So she got to come shadow. And basically, that's how I got in. And she put in a good word. So yeah, so my best advice is obviously you have to keep applying. Of course, you know, like I said, I applied to a lot of jobs, but also you have to figure out ways to kind of meet people. So that could be um, through different social media outlets, or maybe you go to like dermatology conferences and meet people, or if there's any sort of like networking events, um, stuff like that. So I think nowadays, and this doesn't just go for dermatology, but a lot of specialties. I think really you have to just kind of start to put yourself out there and not be afraid of, of maybe like someone doesn't get back to you, like, or they say, no, um, that's okay. So it's all about putting yourself out there and figuring out other ways to meet people in the specialty that you want to get into. Right. Right. Wow. The power of social media. (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. I keep getting this question about dermatology being such a high paying specialty. It is. It's a really good specialty, guys. <laughs> it is. Yeah. So um, dermatology, I think the reason why it gets a uh, rep, uh, rep for being high paying one, again, it's usually outpatient private practice, which is known for being more higher paying than inpatient medicine. And of course, like I said, there's a lot of cosmetics involved. Right. Cosmetics are out of pocket. They're pretty expensive. They're pricey. So I think that's that's why there's um, a high revenue in these type of offices. So that's why there's a higher salary. Right, right. Thank you for answering that. Thank you, because I kept getting that. Okay, okay, that's none of y'all business. But okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you guys can also like look it up. Um, there's uh, there's a lot of, I mean, all jobs pretty pretty much pay really well. Of course, um, some pay more than others. Um, but Derm is definitely one of them. But yep. thank you for getting <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna move on to the case study presentation. Um, so I'm gonna have Nicole share her screen and get ready to present. <laughs> all right. So. Um, let's see. Okay. So I think it's sharing, but let me know if for some reason there's an issue. Okay. Yeah. I see it's, I I see the screen share. Okay. Yep. It's pulling up now. All right. Perfect. So this is just kind of a quick little case study, but I thought it was interesting because it's something, it's not like super common, but also at the same time I do see it. Um, and it's interesting because a lot of people don't know about it. So All right. So this is, I made up this patient, but this is like a classic example. So this is a 30 year old female patient presenting to the office with a rash that has been on the stomach area and the chest for about 10 days. The patient denies any itching, burning or tenderness. Um, She states the rash started with one larger patch 
on the chest area, which was there for about a day. And then it started spreading to all these other patches. Um, she denies any other symptoms. So like I said, she's not having any itching or anything like that. She's not having uh, anything else happen except for the fact that visibly she has this rash. She denies having any medical condition. She's not taking any medications. She has no allergies. So she just can't figure out what's causing this rash. So if we look at this picture, we see this larger patch of skin. So if you can imagine like this larger patch, like I said, it started on her chest. So imagine this larger patch on her chest for about a day or a few days. And then all of a sudden she started getting all these smaller patches all over her abdomen, stomach area, um, and then her chest. So I don't know if anyone has ever had this rash before or if anyone has any experience. Um, if you want to take any guesses before Can I take the you mind, I'm making, Do you mind, sorry to interrupt, do you mind making the screen um, full screen? Uh, yes, let's see. Oh, that's not how you make a full screen. Um, oops. And yeah, how do I make it full screen? Um, oh, wait, I think I just have to. There should be. Okay, there we go. Okay, so um, if anyone has any guesses before I say the answer, you guys can put that in the chat. And I'll give you like a couple seconds. If you don't know, it's totally fine. But I just figured I would give anyone a chance. Penny Rice is Rosea, Rosacea. I, I'm just throwing out some of the, the uh, answer choices. I'm seeing Tinia Versicolor, Penny Rice is the Herald Patch. Yeah. Ringworm. So those, yeah, those are all really good um, guesses. And actually, yeah, so some people got it right. So pityriasis rosea, so maybe some of you have had it before. Um, so this is, it's a viral rash, actually. It's caused by a virus, uh, virus the herpes virus 6 and 7. Um, what triggers it? I mean, sometimes it, ju it just happens. You know, maybe if you're, uh, your immune system's down, that can sometimes trigger it. Or like having a flu um, or vaccine can sometimes trigger it to come out. But the thing is about this is that it lasts kind of a while. So it can last around six to 12 weeks. And after the rash resolves, um, there could be some lingering discoloration that can last for months, um, which will fade with time. Um, someone mentioned Harold Patch. So yeah, that's classic. But as I mentioned, like this large patch that occurred first before the rash started spreading to other areas, that's very classic. Usually there's this one larger patch that happens first, usually around one to 20 days before the rash, the whole rash um, erupts. But also, it, you know, there's always different presentations. Sometimes there might not be a herald patch, but that's pretty typical. Mostly it's going to affect teenagers and young adults. That's usually who we see it in. Most common times uh, we see it is in the spring and fall, although, again, it can happen any time of the year. But those are the most common times we see it. And as this, um, you know, fake patient that I created, she said she had no symptoms. She was having no itching or anything like that, which is very classic. Usually people aren't itchy or burning or having any symptoms. Um, sometimes, you know, they, like I said, it could happen after like they had a, if their immune system was down or they had some sort of upper respiratory infection. So maybe they had like a cough, a cold or a sore throat, and then they got this rash. But usually patients say, no, they didn't have any sort of illnesses, um, before getting this rash. Again, it's common on the chest area and like the abdomen area or the stomach area and also the back. Sometimes it could be on like the legs or the arms uh, or neck. Very rarely would it be on the face or the scalp. I don't think I've ever seen it um, spread to the face or scalp. Again, usually not itchy. So patients usually aren't bothered by it, except for the fact of like the way it looks. You know, they obviously have all these uh, rash marks all over the bro their body. Um, getting it for a second time is pretty uncommon, although it could happen. Um, so when a patient comes in with this in the office, um, usually we diagnose it clinically, which means usually 
we see it, you know, based off of how it looks and the questions we ask in the patient's history, usually we could just diagnose it uh, right there in, in the office. Sometimes if we're unsure or maybe it's presenting a little bit differently than how it usually does, maybe we'll do a biopsy, meaning we'll take a piece of skin and send it to the lab for testing. Um, treatment for it, like I said, usually isn't causing any itching or issues and it just resolves on its own. So like I said, it could kind of last a while, but it resolves on its own. So technically you don't need to treat it at all. You really don't need to actually do anything. Although typically I will give like a topical steroid cream just to kind of help it along as well as go over like some dry skincare um, treatments such as like moisturizing with a good uh, moisturizer twice a day, um, avoiding taking really long hot showers and avoiding using prog uh, products with fragrance in it because that can just further irritate the skin which might make the rash last longer or maybe you'll get a secondary rash on top of this rash. So yeah, this is something really common and I just thought it was interesting because uh, I definitely see like quite a bit of patients coming in with it. Um, maybe like one patient, like every few weeks might come in with this. So yeah, I thought that this was pretty interesting. So that was my little case study. <laughs> thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I definitely remember that rash from PA school. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, there was a great question. Um, someone said, with rashes, do you think you were well-prepared schooling-wise and through your job to identify rashes on different races and ethnicities? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, so definitely different skin care, uh, or sorry, different dermatology conditions uh, present differently on different skin types and tones. So, um you know, I would say I had a pretty good training when we were training and I was learning, uh, you know, in my six month training period, I saw patients of all different skin types and tones. So I was able to see rashes present differently on different skin types, as well as the uh, my work provided like PowerPoint presentations for us to study from. And, you know, it was good that they used pictures of rashes uh, presenting differently in different skin types. But Definitely, it could be difficult. Even to this day, it could be difficult because, yes, things do look different on different um, skin types. So it, it definitely is difficult. And I think, you know, you just learn it with practice. You know, um, you learn it by seeing it. So the more you see different skin types and the more you see all different types of rashes, the better you're going to be and the more uh, you're going to learn. Um so yeah, I would say definitely in the beginning, um, again, I always felt, you know, you're always going to feel not super confident, but with time you will gain experience and with time you will feel more confident. <laughs> yes, definitely agree with that. <clears throat> definitely, definitely. Um, when I was in school, um, I, you know, made um, flashcards and put the pictures on them, like, you know, upload pictures on flashcards online and just go through them. Like the more you see them, the more, you know, you get more familiar with the, how it looks and presentation and everything. So repetition yep. definitely is. Key. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. Thank you for that. Um, so what are some other common rashes that you see in practice? Definitely um, rash, rashes associated with eczema. That's very, very common. Eczema is very, <laughs> super common. And I think some people always think that eczema is like, we only see it in the winter time uh, because up here in Northeast, it's cold. So people get eczema in the winter. But honestly, I, we see eczema all year round. Some people's eczema actually flares up more in the summer when it's hot and humid. So we see eczema all year round. Definitely, I would say there was an increase in eczema this year compared to what I usually see because a lot of people um, have been washing their hands more often um, because of COVID. So a lot of a lot of hand eczema. So, yeah, definitely a lot of eczema. Um, psoriasis as well is another pretty common rash that we see. Um a lot of something called seborrheic dermatitis, which is yeast, overgrowth of yeast um, on the scalp, as well as can happen on the face, chest, neck area. 
been seeing that that's always very common as well. Um, in the summertime, tinea versicolor, which is a fungal infection as well, that's pretty common in the summertime um, because usually that uh, can be caused by sweating or like hot, humid weather. And a lot of times people notice it in the summer because those the area of the skin that is affected by the fungus um, doesn't like tan with the sun. So that's why a lot of times people notice it in the summer. So I'd say those are the most uh, common rashes that I see. Okay, cool. Cool. Yeah, I remember a lot of those from school, especially tinea versicolor. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So are there any more questions? We're almost, um, time's almost up. Any more questions for Nicole, guys? Let's see if we miss anything. Someone said, um, does, does pity rice is typically scar? So not scar, but as I mentioned, pity rice rosea can leave discoloration. So um, and that's the case with a lot of rashes. It's not just that rash, even like eczema, psoriasis, anything like that. There's always a chance of it leaving discoloration um, left behind. And the reason for that usually is because when there's any sort of inflammation on the skin, uh, the skin reacts by overproducing melanocytes, which are the cells that um, give uh, our skin our pigment. So, yeah, so a lot of times we're left with discoloration left behind. Um, but, you know, this which discoloration is definitely difficult to treat, but it fades with time. So, yes, it could be some discoloration, but with time, that will continue to fade. Okay. Thank you for answering that. Um, one question. Um, another question is, uh, what are some tips you have to, for a student to get accepted into a direct entry PA program? Yeah, so if that's what you're interested in, then you have to start looking um, when you're in high school, because like I said, you're going to apply when you're in high school. So you want to start looking, you know, your junior year, I would say start looking at schools that have these um, direct entry accelerated programs and start to see if you could do if they have like any open houses or if you can go visit the school to see if the campus is. Um, so you can start to get an idea of what schools you're going to want to apply to. And as always, even when you're obviously applying to PA school after undergrad, same um, concepts apply when you're applying to these direct entry programs. You obviously need to have a good um, application. So that includes having obviously a high GPA, um, as well as having like extracurricular activities. Obviously, patient care hours you're, you don't get until pretty much after you're already accepted, but they're going to still want to see that you did something. So I... Um, actually volunteered at a, in high school, I volunteered at a hospital um, for a few years. So I had a lot of hours volunteering at a, at a hospital. So you still want to make sure you're getting some sort of hours, like volunteer hours or something that you're doing in healthcare. Um, so that way it'll look good on your application. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was some great advice. That was some awesome advice. Okay. Um, Somebody said, do you ever have those, I don't know what this is moments? <laughs> yes. And that's funny because I was just talking to um, colleagues that I work with the other day. And we actually were just talking about this because I did have a patient the other day um, with this very, um, you know, abnormal presenting skin lesions that I have never seen before. Um, and I said to the patient, uh, listen, you know, we're going to do a couple different treatments, but I will be honest, I'm not 100% sure what this is. And I was honest with the patient. I'm not going to tell them, yeah, I think it's this or um, yeah, it's definitely this when I'm not actually sure. So I said, I'm not 100% sure, but let's try this. And then if it's not getting better, we're going to do a skin biopsy where we'll take a piece of skin and send it to the lab. So yes, there are times where me or other colleagues just have you know, get a really, you know, weird case that we have never seen before. Um, but the thing is, is that like you develop skills that even if you're like, okay, I have no idea what this is. I've never seen this before. I've never learned about this. Um, you know, the skills and the right steps to take to figure it out. So I knew that even though I didn't know what this was, I knew there were a couple of treatments that were pretty um, generalized that we could try. 
And then I knew that if it wasn't getting better, I could always rely on doing a skin biopsy. Mm, that's true. That's very true. Yeah, and uh, steroids. <laughs> <laughs> try right, for steroids, steroids huh? Everything. Yeah, it's always steroids. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, they I it's steroids and skin conditions, man. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I mean a lot, you know, obviously there are rashes where um giving them a topical steroid cuz could actually make it worse, especially in some fungal right. rashes. But yeah, a lot of rashes are inflammatory. I would say that's the majority of the rashes we see which usually are treated by steroids. Right, right, right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so, but what, what is your take on steroids? So, yeah, I mean, topical steroids, um, like I said, they are needed for certain rashes. That is the uh, standard or the gold standard of treatment. Um, yeah. Of course, you know, we try to always educate our patients because there are side effects like skin side effects that would actually be um, not good when you use topical steroids for long term without taking a break. So we just always try to tell patients that um, and hopefully they're listening. Um, So yeah, we use topical steroids for short periods of time um, when they are needed. Right, right, right. (laughs) Thank you for that. Okay. So let's see if there's any final questions. Answer one or two more questions. And your skin looks lovely, by the way. (laughs) Oh, thank you. I don't know if you guys can see on camera, but I do have a pimple right there. But um, (laughs) (laughs) okay, let's see. Um, I don't see. Let me see any more questions. Any one last question? I'm not answering um, e shadowing related questions. Anything related to Durham or PA school? Okay. Somebody asked about Pimp- Mr. Pimple Popper or Pimple Popper. Do you watch that show? <laughs> um, Dr. Dr. Pimple, Pimple Popper. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes. Patients always ask me that. They're like, yeah, I'm obsessed with that show. Like, do you watch it? Um, I really don't watch it. I've seen like a few episodes, but I really don't watch it that much. Um, <laughs> and I think the reason for that is because I'm, you know, like I experience these type of things every day in the office. So I don't really want to watch a show on it. But yeah, <laughs> it's an interesting show. Yeah. And I think a lot of people enjoy it. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole, for coming on. Thank you for um, teaching us, hearing about your story and your journey and giving us your insight and advice. Thank you so much. We really, really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Once again, I'll um, put in her social media. It's at Nicole Finn Derm on all social platforms. Nicole Finn Derm. At Nicole Finn Derm. Uh, make sure to follow her Instagram, TikTok, <laughs> YouTube. Thank you so much. And thank you for building the platform that you have on your social media pages and just educating and being a pillar for the PA community. Yeah, yeah, of course. Thank you. Thanks, to everyone. Thank you. So nice having you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys. All right. So I'm going to end the session. I'll um, hang around in the chat to answer some questions, but we're going to end. I'll see you all next week. Thank you once again, Nicole. Have a nice night and have a great week. All right. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye.